living. Work. Future. Welcome to Learning is the New Working and the third episode in our series Connecting the Dots. I thought today that we'd go on location for this episode. So I'm here reporting from the Learning Futures Group typing pool. Now, you're going to need to use your imagination here um, and imagine that it's 1975. Obviously, because many of you have never even heard of a typing pool, let alone actually been to one. But here in 1975 LFG, like every other business on the planet this year, ideas, data, information of all types is rooted through a group of typists that we employ to make our ideas legible and communicable. They transcribe them from recordings or handwritten notes and they type them out as memos with two and CC lines, and they make copies and distribute them via our inter-office couriers. And because here at LFG we're tech-obsessed, we use state-of-the-art Smith Corona Super 5 electric typewriters, considered by many to be the quietest, most efficient, and fastest typewriters ever built. Electronic carriage returns, ribbon cartridges, all innovations developed by this venerable Smith Corona company that's been making typewriters since 1909. And because we at 1975 LFG invest in the skills of our employees, They can type well above the industry standard of 50 to 80 words per minute. These skills are highly prized and in demand. And usually, these skills are held by women. Over 10% of all women in the workforce in the early 70s had typing and secretarial roles. In fact, since the 1910s, an entire industry has taught these vocational skills primarily to women promising them liberation, in inverted commas, from domestic and factory work. At hundreds of professional colleges and institutions, just like the Catherine Gibbs chain of vocational schools that was popular here in the US. Now you know, because you listened to the first two episodes, that macro forces at work, the economy, technology, and changes in social values have always combined to shape our lives and our work experience and set the training agenda. Back here in 1975, they're about to come into full force in a massive way that's beautifully illustrated by this guy. Members of the committee, as introduced, I'm Lee Thompson, the chairman and chief executive officer of Smith Corona Corporation. And certainly at this time, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on U.S. competitiveness. What we went through day before yesterday is the saddest day in my over 30-year business career. To have to advise 875 employees of a company that had been in Cortland, New York for 110 years, that they no longer had employment, and that they had little opportunity in the future This is the most difficult thing any American company has to do. And it's a direct result. We'll hear a lot more from Mr. Lee Thompson, chairman of the Smith Corona Corporation, in a few minutes. But trust me for now, when I report that within a very short period of time, the skills of transcription, typing, stenography, that have been in demand for over 75 years and created a whole class of women in the workforce will become, to all intents and purposes, irrelevant. But you knew that, right? Back here in the 1975 typing pool, these major forces are stirring into life. The first disruptive force is a change in social values, especially relating to women's role in the workforce and society. Just four years earlier, in 1971, 
American feminist Gloria Steinem ridicule the dead-end busy work of the typing pool as a symptom of female oppression when, at the 1971 Smith College commencement speech, she ironically threatened the status quo with the question, what if an entire generation of women refuse to learn how to type? By standing up, by refusing to be cheap labor pools anymore, whether it's in the kitchen or in the office or in the factory or on the campus, we will revolutionize this system. We will revolutionize this economy. We will humanize it for a more compassionate distribution of goods and services and of human opportunity. If we do, perhaps we have a chance for a third kind of period. After all, we have had 5,000 years of um, a kind of superiority of women. We've had 5,000 years of patriarchy and racism. Perhaps we have a chance for 5,000 years of humanism. And perhaps, if we really live this revolution every day, historians will look back at this time and say that for the first time, the human animal stopped dividing itself up according to visible difference, according to race, according to sex, and started to look for the real and the human potential inside. Thank you. Within 10 years, the Catherine Gibson chain of vocational schools will be sold and rebranded and slowly slide into irrelevance. The vocational secretarial college industry will essentially disappear. The second disruptive change is going to be brought by technology. The same year of 1975, two childhood friends, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, founded the company Microsoft. Within eight years, Microsoft will release its first word processor called Multi-Tool Word. And broader than this, the exponential growth in silicon chip manufacturing and network connectivity will launch the fourth industrial revolution. Now, there's a third macro force at work in the late 70s and 80s, and it's the rise of globalization, the deregulation of markets and the reduction of trade barriers around the world. The Mr. Thompson chairman of Smith Corona, will point out is the root cause of the most difficult day of his professional life and the root cause of his company's demise. That's in his testimony to the Banking Committee, the Senate Banking Committee, on July the 23rd, 1992. For more than 100 years, Smith Corona has been the world leader in the manufacture of portable typewriters. First manual, then electric, then electronic, and now word processing. The typewriter industry has long been driven by design ingenuity, features, consumer needs, and market dynamics such as pricing. In the mid-1970s, our foreign competitors took a new approach, targeted our industry, targeted our country, and initiated unfair pricing. This divergence from fair competition sent the industry on the race to the bottom. Just two days ago, as I've said, we announced the eventual relocation of our manufacturing operations to Mexico, costing 775 full-time jobs and 100 temporary jobs. Within two years of his testimony, Smith Corona will declare bankruptcy, and the Smith Corona S5 will remain forever the world's most advanced electric typewriter. And of course, completely irrelevant. Learning. Work. Future. Well, hindsight is 2020, of course, but I think it's pretty clear Learning. that Chairman Thompson misses the point in his testimony. It is, of course, possible that cheap labor and deregulated international competition took market share from his company. But the real issue was that the market itself was fast disappearing anyway. Smith Corona had missed critical macro trends, social and technical. They'd failed to invest and they'd failed to innovate. They were in love with their own solution to a problem that was about to disappear with the arrival of personal computing and soon after the internet. This awesome company that 
that had pioneered and innovated for over a hundred years, built the first typewriter in 1909, built its first electric typewriter in 1955, invented the powered carriage return and the cartridge ribbon replacement in 1973. The company that built the Smith Corona Super 5 series had completely missed the point. And it had built the last electric typewriter in the world, a typewriter that was for the most part completely irrelevant. I first heard this story and absolutely want to give credit to the amazing and lovely Jay Cross, who was an e-learning pioneer, a futurist and a thinker in Silicon Valley, and who I met in the 1990s. We might rightly credit him with popularising the term e-learning, and he was a provocative and prolific thinker and a champion of informal learning models. A few years after I first met Jay in Silicon Valley, I invited him to travel north and speak at a conference that I hosted at Microsoft. And he told the Smith Corona story to a group of about 200 learning practitioners at Microsoft. I think at the time he meant it as a warning to a company that I think he was predicting was about to build the last best personal computer in the world. Five years later, the so-called post-PC era arrived with iPads and iPhones and a whole new class of computing devices breaking new ground. It seemed at the time that Jay's dire predictions for Microsoft could well have played out. Thankfully, that wasn't the case. But this story has always stayed with me, and his warning of pending irrelevance and what to do about it is supremely pertinent to the current practice of learning and development in the workforce. So I promised that in this episode we'd start to get to the so what. So what does all this have to do with the future of workplace learning? Well, I probably don't need to spell it out to you in words of one syllable, but it is pretty imperative that you ask yourself the question, is the work that I'm doing today on an onboarding program or an e-learning course or a leadership strategy project, is the work that I'm doing today the equivalent of building the last best typewriter in the world? So what became of the typing pool from 1975? Well, the rapid evolution of productivity software and networking enabled people to capture, digitize, and share and distribute their thoughts within the flow of work, with no intermediary necessary. Women pushed themselves into non-vocational professional schooling. 51% of degree recipients were female in 2019 and they continue to push into all fields and at all levels of work becoming an increasing force for profound change in the modern workplace in everything from flexible working hours to a shift in mindset that Aaron Hurst and others call the purpose economy this is something we'll explore in other episodes nevertheless there's still important work to be done work on skills development, and work on culture. Let me give you an example of one macro trend that's hard at work today, shaping our future and creating important questions for us to address. According to data from the National Center for Women in Technology, women represent 57% of the workforce here in North America. And yet just 25% of workers in computing-related fields are women. And in terms of pipeline, women represent only 21% of the computer-related bachelor's degrees awarded in 2019, but 51% of all degrees that were awarded that year. Even more disturbing is that the decline is 15 percentage points since 1985, when women earned 37% of all computing degrees. Given the desperate need for technical skills, and given the clear understanding that diversity is critical to build software platforms and programs that will work for everybody, this is really a big issue. Here's some important questions that we should consider. Is coding the new typing? There's such a hunger for those technical skills. 
How can we build a diverse army of practitioners around?